It's really my privilege tonight for the second portion of the program to introduce one of my colleagues and my wife's doctor and surgeon as well, and that's uh, Dr. Chris Allen. Chris is an associate professor of orthopedics and sports medicine. He practices mostly predominantly hand surgeon at Harborview, so we we're able to share the care of many injured patients, uh, but uh, Chris does an amazing job. My wife's very happy now that her trigger finger has been successfully released. He's, uh, he works here at the School of Medicine as well. He was also awarded uh, a uh, clinical scientist traveling fellowship by the uh, American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons to study cell biology and tissue engineering. So he's not only an excellent clinical surgeon, but he does a fair amount of research as well. He's presented papers at over 20 national meetings. He's a principal investigator, which means he's got to organize and write and coordinate the grants for two uh, major research projects. He's had 15 peer-reviewed articles and six book chapters that he's authored in his scholarly career. It's kind of a line eye night. I don't know any recovering Bears fans out there tonight. Uh, Chris also it was uh, born and raised in the Chicago area. Went to school undergrad at the University of Illinois downstate, he says, and got his MD degree at Northwestern in Chicago. He did his orthopedic residency there at the University of Chicago, so he really got to sample all the great academic institutions that that city had to offer. He then really broke out uh, and, and went beyond the limits of Chicago and Illinois and went to Baylor where he did his hand and microvascular fellowship. So he trained five years as an orthopedic surgeon, then he did what, another two years, one three, year. one year, uh, to, do, to learn specifically just how to operate on the hand, particularly in, and with the hand, a lot of it's done under the microscope because the structures are so fine and so detailed. His research interests, again, are in wound repair and regeneration and tissue engineering, how to make new tissues out of biological materials and application of these fields to traumatic injury. And as such, he's been awarded a two-year grant from uh, DARPA, which is the U Department of Defense Advanced Research Projects and Agency. And they fund a lot of different robotic projects and everything, but it's mostly to look at restorative injury repair. How do how do and other creatures uh, regenerate limbs, fingers, digits, etc., and what kind of those types of biologic processes and technology may be applicable to human beings? He's uh, an active member at the, at the University of Washington Department of Orthopedics, which is actually one of the best uh, considered and most competitive orthopedic residencies in the entire country and have really been pioneers in development of a lot of uh, treatment uh, uh, for orthopedic injuries and diseases. He's a husband and father, and you can see his family here. He's uh, an avid runner, and he does uh, marathon trail running, and here he is uh, showing his abilities as quite the mutter on the course. He's also a very accomplished musician, and Believe it or not, one of the things we love to do in the operating room during mundane portions of operations is listen to music. It helps kind of soothe things, and, and uh, I'm, a, I'm very proud of my iPod and my music collection, but I'm, I'm told that mine is nowhere as well developed, particularly in acoustic music and bluegrass, is Chris Allen's. So he's an accomplished musician, and, and uh, he uh, has a, a musical group playing mostly acoustic and uh, bluegrass type music with fellow orthopedics. So it's really my pleasure to introduce a, a, a wonderful colleague and a great man, Dr. Chris Allen. Good grief. So I'm going to talk. Carpal tunnel syndrome is, is an interest of mine, but we'll talk about uh, carpal tunnel syndrome in the workplace and otherwise, and other occupational hand injuries and the entire future of extremity surgery, blah, 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 and everything in the world. But then back to carpal tunnel. So carpal tunnel syndrome is, uh, by definition, it's compression of the median nerve in the carpal canal. And this is an interesting slide I borrowed from a colleague of mine. And that almost looks like a, a little glass uh, structure in there rather than the median nerve. But that's purported to be the median nerve. And the arrow is pointing at a 
a region of compression. And so we'll talk about anatomy with these talks about conditions. It's good to think about anatomy, what does the, the structure look like when it's normal, the pathophysiology, what happens when things go awry, and then diagnoses and treatments. This is the median nerve. It comes from cervical root C5, 6, 7, 8, and it runs down the middle of the arm. and underneath the cover of multiple muscles. Then we flip the hand up, and here's the carpal tunnel, the carpal canal. <laughs> carpal is Greek or Latin for wrist, and uh, bounded on three sides by bone, and the, the topmost surface, the volar surface, bounded by the transverse uh, carpal ligament. And we'll try and screen that for you right here. And the median nerve is right here. So it runs underneath this very stout fibrous band with the nine tendons that flex the fingers and thumb. And so there's not much space. And as we age or as we uh, either extend or bend the wrist, pressure on the nerve, preferentially on the nerve, can cause problems. The tendons are, are uh, much stronger structurally than is nerve tissue. And so we'll look at a couple of things that can happen. So thinking about the histopathology or things that go wrong at the tissue level, the blood nerve barrier breaks down, and you get what's called endoneural edema. Edema is just... Uh, fluid filling up a space, and it's fluid, not just water, but fluid with proteins deposited in it. Endoneural means within the nerve, and so this leads to connective tissue thickening as this stuff is sort of like jello in the liquid phase, if jello exists anymore, I don't even know, but jello in the liquid phase, and then as it solidifies, you have this sort of, this uh, stuff that you can't move well through, and, and so that doesn't do well for the nerve. Localized fiber demyelination, the outer lining of the nerves is myelin that helps conduction. So if you lose the myelin layer, conduction is slowed. And then diffuse fiber demyelination, and finally axon degeneration, or death of the nerve. And you can see as you move from outer uh, circle to inner circle, what the symptoms in each stage of the histopathology of carpal tunnel might look like. So first, paresthesias, or abnormal sensibility, on an intermittent basis, and then this becomes constant and eventually you have numbness and or atrophy or thinning out of the muscle. And the muscle innervated by the median nerve motor branch are the uh, muscles of the thenar or thumb region with the exception of one of the deep ones which gets a contribution from the ulnar nerve. And then some of the sensory testing we can do. And so the ways this shows up, uh, the, way, the reason that this happens is in part the nerve transmits substances which allow for nerve transmission uh, of electrical impulses as for example acetylcholine, these little vesicles spit out the acetylcholine at the synaptic cleft, and that comes from upstream in the nerve. So these substances are made in the cell body up here, and then transported, mechanically transported down the length of the nerve, and the nerve can be three feet long in some cases. So all these things are compressed, and so transmission, delivery of these, uh, the components of the synaptic vesicles is impaired with compression, and it's also the case that the bloodstream is very important, the blood supply of the nerve is very important. So the mechanical activity of secreting these uh, neurotransmitters requires oxygen, requires uh, that that be delivered via blood vessels. So if you compress the nerve, you compress the supply of oxygen. So for those two reasons, mechanical compression of actually the transport of components for nerve transmission and mechanical compression of the, nerve, of the vessels associated with the nerve, for those two reasons, compression of the nerve causes dysfunction of the nerve. So that's what we think might be going on in at least some cases of carpal tunnel syndrome. So who gets carpal tunnel syndrome? Probably because of the smaller size of the carpal canal, females predominate in a two to one ratio. Roughly one out of 250 uh, persons will develop carpal tunnel syndrome with a peak age at 50. I'm 51, so maybe I missed it. That's great. Workplace injuries and workplace exposures and workplace uh, abnormal posturing can lead to occupational disorders. So folks in manufacturing or construction or assembly work or food processing or with vibratory tool use, uh, the pressure in the carpal tunnel goes up 15 times if you fully hyperextend the wrist or fully flex the wrist. So if you're reaching around behind, oh, I don't know, something as you're an electrician or working with uh, uh, refrigeration units or something like that, you're at risk of carpal tunnel syndrome. Everybody talks about computer keyboard use, and that may be the, the most common population from which we see patients with complaints of carpal tunnel syndrome. But the, despite every, many, many studies having been done, there's inadequate epidemiological evidence for a definitive association with uh, computer keyboard and mouse use and the condition of carpal tunnel syndrome. 
and yet I know that after a long bout, particularly with you know poor ergonomics, which is sort of my the way I do all typing. I'm always you know one hand you know on my little four-year-old and one hand trying to write a paper that was due two years ago. Um, <laughs> if you do things incorrectly long enough, they hurt. So I, I personally feel like it makes sense, but uh, if you go to the literature, as you should as a scientist, there isn't evidence for it. Many, many conditions are associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. And you can see, as you run through the list, that most of these are sort of packing disorders. So rheumatoid arthritis leads to synovial thickening, so the tendon linings uh, grow in size. And that carpal tunnel does not accommodate a change in size of those tendons. And the softest thing in there is the nerve, and it gets squished. Um, many of these other conditions, such as gout and amyloidosis, also result in, in overpacking in that space. Diabetes is a disorder which unfortunately leads to dysfunction in almost every major system, including the microcirculation. So the nerve's uh, vascular supply is impaired. And you can sort of run through the list and imagine how masses and aberrant muscles, et cetera, would cause problems. Uh, how does it show up? Numbness in the distribution of the median nerve, which is shown here in green. So the, the, the radial, this being the radial side, this being the radius bone, the radial three and a half digits most uh, involved and often nighttime symptoms are the, the beginning, and you get numbness and tingling. I get this from time to time. If it, we all tend to sleep in the fetal position, and so you mash things down. And if you do so long enough, you'll wake up with numb fingers. Another big one is to wake up with the ulnar one and a half digits numb from the ulnar nerve being stretched across the medial epicondyle of the elbow, as shown here in blue. Uh, and on examination, we try and get at that with first the history, which is more important and should precede the examination but then asking questions uh, with examination, such as pressure on the carpal tunnel. So that would be right here in the palm of the hand, pressing. And uh, this was originally um, developed by a doctor named Durkan, who worked at, uh, in, in Hood River, where there are a lot of folks who apparently that's a big windsurfing area. And, and these guys and gals would be wrapping their wrists around their windsurfing boards and, and hyperflexing to, to ride these 40 mile an hour uh, waves. And they'd come in with carpal tunnel syndrome. He developed this little device that exerted a, a constant amount of pressure onto the median nerve to try and reproduce their symptoms. And so now we don't actually use the device, but just press hard enough to blanch the capillaries in your thumb. And you know you're exceeding the closing pressure of the capillaries around the nerve. And then wait 15, 30 seconds and see if you reproduce the symptoms that the patient described. And so that's a fairly sensitive and specific test uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, Tonell's and Phelan's sign, uh, Tonell's sign is tapping on the nerve, and that can stimulate uh, tingling or sort of electric shock feeling. And Phelan's sign is sort of reproduction of this business of hyperflexion or reverse Phelan's of hyperextension. Uh, the most commonly used test now is probably that median nerve compression test, which I just described, and then sensory motor loss. And that can be found out through a variety of examination tools with little monofilaments of, of graded diameter. And then also electric diagnostic studies with numbers that you shouldn't need to worry about. But it basically works like this. If you stimulate the nerve above the carpal tunnel in the transverse carpal ligament, and then a second electrode downstream receives the impulse, you can actually measure the latency of electrical transmission.